Okay, I got two o'clock. Let's get started so we have plenty of time for Q&A at the end of this. Uh, this is the meeting of the VMware SIG at the first day of Kubicon, and we're here to talk about storage when you run Kubernetes on uh, the vSphere hypervisor. Um, I'm the blue picture, that's David. Uh, we both work for VMware on Kubernetes, and uh, I'm chair of the VMware SIG, which is a group uh, that hosts a meeting place for both developers of Kubernetes code related to running Kubernetes on vSphere, as well as users who are running Kubernetes on top of the vSphere hypervisor. And this applies to anybody running Kubernetes, whether it's a VMware distribution or another distribution like Red Hat uh, OpenShift or just pure open source upstream Kubernetes. Our agenda today is we're gonna go, even though this was advertised as an intro, so this maybe is getting towards a gray area, getting into deep dive and what we're gonna cover here. So I'm gonna rush through kind of the history of how external volumes are supported in Kubernetes. Uh, we're going to go briefly into the situation with what's called the legacy plugin, and I'll get into what that means, then move on to uh, the container storage interface, which is the, the future of Kubernetes and external volume mounts, maybe the future and the present. Um, and we'll, we'll get into the specifics of the CSI driver for vSphere and wrap up with operation best practices and a demo by David. Um, we'll touch briefly on migration from entry to out of tree and troubleshooting. So external volume mounts, what are they? How do they work? Why are they useful? Uh, they're useful for running stateful apps in Kubernetes. You know, the 12 factors said everything should be stateless, but the reality is that that was just declaring that the hard parts are somebody else's problem. And people want to run stateful apps inside uh, containers and have them managed by an orchestrator like Kubernetes and these external volume mounts are the key to managing to do this. You know, they, the way containers work, if you don't use external storage, the life of your storage is potentially the shorter of the life of the pod or the life of that node that it's running on. So if you kill it, your database is gone, like potentially forever, not a good story. So being able to schedule uh, pods at a number of different locations and still have them linked up to their storage is valuable just to address life cycle, but it also is potentially valuable to address high availability uh, and scale. You know, they, if you were only using direct attached storage in whatever physical node was hosting uh, your Kubernetes worker node, there's a physical size limit on how big that can be. There are people with databases that need to go well beyond that. And uh, these external volume mounts are the key to extending your life cycle, your, your, life cycle, your lifetime, uh, your potential maximum size. Um, and that's how you bring this about. Uh, the goal of this Kubernetes persistent volume abstraction was to provide an identical interface everywhere to abstract out the storage so that you can't tell where you're running. If you do this right, you should be able to write an app that can't even tell where it's running so that it's cloud native, meaning I could move this app unchanged, run it in the AWS public cloud, the Google public cloud, the Azure public cloud, or take it on-prem running on a vSphere hypervisor, for example, and nothing in the app changed. So the persistent volume abstraction is designed to allow that kind of thing to happen. Uh, the original design with Kubernetes put these volume plugins, the volume plugin was just an adaptation to do the actual code that provides an abstraction layer so that storage type A looks like storage type B, and you achieve this potential portability. In the early days of Kubernetes, all of these volume plugins were 
built into Kubernetes itself. Right in tree, they were in the Kubernetes GitHub repo. And as Kubernetes got more popular, bigger, and more people wanted to host these storage plugins, it essentially was on the road to becoming unworkable. There are a couple bad things with having them in tree. If I might move to a certain cloud or underlying provider, and I'm only using one or two of these storage plugins, yet the rest of the code happens to be built in there. Uh, the code actually ran as part of Kubernetes itself, so there's a potential, uh, potentially if there is a security flaw in the code in one of these drivers, it isn't as well isolated as it might be from Kubernetes itself. Uh, a third issue with having them in tree is that you've tied the release cycles together. So suppose I want to add a feature to the storage plugin or there's a bug and I want to fix it, I can't get that binary out there to the users without doing a new release of all of Kubernetes, which is gated by a lot of other things because at any given time in a patch cycle, you're, one storage provider isn't likely to be the only bug fix in the queue. And they're not going to do one of these Kubernetes releases every five minutes. So it tied the release cycles together. By moving these storage plugins out of tree, the storage, the, the storage adapters can be worked on completely independently, and a user can install only the bare minimum of what they particularly need. And if somebody publishing one of these external storage plugins chooses to publish it in the, this week, that can be done independently of Kubernetes. So there doesn't need to be a Kubernetes re-release to get that out there to the world. So these originals were built in, and there was an option called a flex driver that technically wasn't built in, but it was a little bit limited in that the flex driver is exact out to a CLI, and it was limited in the available features, and those weren't deemed to be the perfect solution for moving out of tree. So the entry version of the plugin for uh, vSphere was called Project Hatchway. It's been out there since 2017. Uh, it's declared GA today. Uh, I've talked to some of you in the audience and the recount, you know, I, I heard some stories of some issue and if you're having one, you're not the first one, but you know, all software has bugs, we'll talk about I'll talk about some of these potential issues later, but we do have this entry one that is still in the Kubernetes uh, release, and the Kubernetes project has kind of given the warning signal that at some point, and they haven't declared an actual cutoff date yet, at some point these things have to go out of tree. But for now, you're, you're fine to use the entry one. Uh, it, I don't think it's likely to go away for at least a year. Uh, it, one thing that comes up in the meetings of the VMware SIG or in our Slack channel is that people are noticing that when this thing starts up, you do get a deprecation warning right now. And I don't know how many people have asked, you know, do I need to worry about this right away? I'm seeing this warning. And the answer is, no, it's just giving you this clue that sometime in the next year, something might change. And we are gonna talk about what the migration path will be later in this talk. Um, the one thing you have to be aware of with this entry thing, even though it works, is that new features have been frozen in this thing since the end of 2018. So there is this out of tree driver and that's that's where investments are being made in supporting new features. So it's out there, it's, it's a GA release, but if you're doing a greenfield Kubernetes deployment, you might wanna look at the, other, the out of tree as an option. Um, so this out of tree uh, project is called the container storage interface. And it moved to GA and Kubernetes in version 1.13. And this is actually not something deemed to be in the Kubernetes project itself. You will find related code 
Vlad here in the front row actually works on some of that enablement. Um, and uh, yeah, it, the reason it's not deemed to be part of Kubernetes is that there are other orchestrators out there, Apache, Mesos, uh, Docker, uh, Cloud Foundry, that also support these same volume plugins. So people in the community uh, who write these volume plugins were being faced with the scenario where they were having to do implementations of different storage plugins for all of these platforms. You know, I think if you went to the keynote today, there was essentially a factual declaration that Kubernetes seems to be out there ahead of the other orchestrators in the popularity race. Uh, but this work has been underway for well over a year, and a lot of storage providers really wanted an industry-wide standard to evolve so that they wouldn't have to do four times the work uh, to support all of these different platforms. So CSI is being run with its a separate organization uh, shepherding the spec for this. Then Kubernetes itself uh, works on code that first negotiate, yeah, there's, there's groups of people who negotiate the CSI interface and feature set. Then people within the Kubernetes project will work on enablement with some of that code being in tree, but the particular storage provider parts of this being out of tree. And it goes through a, a cycle when new features are added where the, the new feature related to storage might have people negotiate an interface expansion. Then Kubernetes has to support that interface. Then the storage plugins actually implement um, the, the, the out of tree end of this. Um, so the CSI for vSphere first release, the alpha is out right now today. And there's been alpha code out. David, that's been since last December, right? Um, a beta is projected to be released in June, so sometime within four weeks-ish, uh, and GA in July. Uh, the features, uh, it uses VMware, VM independent volume management, which the entry uh, did not. And uh, if you're not familiar with the, I think some of this audience knows what that means. It's sometimes been called first class disk. But the older releases of VMware closely coupled the hypervisor volumes to individual VMs. Uh, later, uh, vSphere was re-architected so that it was possible to define disks completely independent of these VMs that could potentially be handed off from one VM to another and be a little more full-featured. So the CSI for vSphere is architected to use these first-class disks. It does mean that some of the ancient releases of vSphere can't go there. And maybe at the end of this, we'll have an audience poll of what releases of vSphere you guys are on now and can, uh, are interested in. But we wanted to move to this because it, it allows certain flexibility benefits. Um, this storage driver can also allow you to take advantage of Kubernetes zones. Kubernetes zones are a feature of Kubernetes where you can intentionally take your worker nodes or clusters and have them straddle across availability boundaries. And of course, the vSphere hypervisor has DRS clusters that were designed to do that as well. But you want a situation where you can make the declarations of what your availability zones might be in the underlying implementation so that the Kubernetes scheduler can do the right thing with regard to um, dispersing pods in an appropriate way for high availability. And since we're talking about stateful apps here, you know, the, the whole reason for using external volumes is to support stateful apps. Generally, availability is a big, a, a, a strong desire. Um, so we can support multiple vCenters, multiple data centers within one vCenter, multiple uh, VMware clusters um, mapped into Kubernetes clusters. Um, you can also publish 
provision these from data store clusters. Um, we have right now support for both conventional and raw mounts. So if you're familiar, I think only the Uber geeks at this point are familiar with that distinction, so let me explain what that means. In the container world, a conventional mount goes and takes this storage volume and it's mapped right into the file system that you'd see from a Linux app. So it would be grafted at some, into some point of your file system tree. A raw mount simply maps it as a device. And there are some database applications that would prefer for performance or whatever reasons to not deal with the file system layer within the Linux operating system and just go at raw device. And it is possible to do that. And I think I talked already about zone support. Uh, there's a link here, and this deck, uh, at the end of the talk today, I'll publish a link to the deck, but you can find the link to the CSI driver here. Um, the roadmap. Um, right now, I was talking about the features in CSI today. Um, roadmap for the rest of the year, this is second half of 2019, possibly later. We're looking at supporting resizing of already provisioned volumes. You can't do that today. That was a recent enhancement to the CSI spec, so normally the CSI spec gets enhanced and it takes a while to catch up with things that are exposed there, so we're planning on supporting the resizing. There is a, an effort now within the Kubernetes storage SIG to support snapshots. Now, granted, if you're familiar with the way vSphere operates, snapshots are built into vSphere, but it takes some work to put that, to expose that into a completely cloud agnostic uh, wrapper so that no matter where I'm hosting my Kubernetes, a public cloud or on vSphere, it all works the same. So there's an effort to standardize an API related to snapshots, and what would what this will enable is a better backup story. So if I'm running something like a Postgres database server on Kubernetes, um, there are ways to back it up by copying the storage to secondary storage. But if the underlying hardware supports a hardware snapshot, it sometimes can be uh, faster and less impact on production workloads to have the backend hardware trigger a hardware accelerated snapshot and then trigger the copy to secondary storage off of that. There are also, there's also work underway to send signals to applications so that they can key S. So as part of that backup story for stateful apps, many if not most or all of them will have caching going on in memory ahead of it getting flushed down to the underlying storage. Often there's three tiers of this where a database server might keep at least indexes up in RAM, and they have in the background lazy attempts to flush that down to disk storage. It would go down to the Linux file system, and then maybe there's a third layer where you need to F-sync the Linux file system to really get a consistent recoverable state onto the disks where, or onto the volumes in this case, where things will be copied to your secondary storage. So work is underway to support that all the way through the APIs down to the underlying storage provisioning, and this is part of the roadmap. Uh, also on the roadmap is support for read-write many volumes so that you could have things in multiple pods all sharing that storage read-write, and today that isn't supported. Um, volume cloning, this is probably towards the back end of the roadmap, I think, but just because People are looking at it, and this, is, this is an expansion to CSI and the storage roadmap within Kubernetes. Also, handling entry to CSI migration. So the Kubernetes storage SIG has a goal with regard to migration where at some point when the cutoff date is reached, where we're going to kill the entry Kubernetes uh, storage plugin, the goal here is that we think we can map, we, we can replace the existing entry code with code that simply calls out to the CSI driver so that if we can pull this off, the migration story for you, the user, is you don't really have to do anything. Uh, you could keep 
you could keep operating under the illusion that you're using the entry, and there is a stub, a stub bit of an entry driver that is simply going to go out and invoke the out of tree CSI code. And um, I think this is aspirational at this point, but nobody has come up with a theoretical reason why it shouldn't work, but it, it, it isn't implemented yet. So thus it's on the roadmap. Um, this is an eye chart where, sorry, but these links are long and you'll get a link to the big deck afterward, but I just wanted to leave you with links for where you can find what I'd say, I'll call this a curated list of documentation. Some of these are official Kubernetes documentation. Some of this, since the storage provider was out of, if the storage provider is out of tree, the docs aren't necessarily found in, uh, alongside Kubernetes itself. So uh, once you get used to it, you can find these, but this, are, this is just some links. Um, the bottom one is very good and at a funny place because Miles here wrote an improved form of the documentation and he's got it out at this location for review and it hasn't, we haven't replaced the official docs with this, but it's a very good uh, source. Uh, there is a link back to slides. I, I, I see Cormac in the audience, but he actually wrote a great blog article explaining first class disk, which is a key element of what's going on in the new CSI driver. So if you don't even know what it means to have disks defined independent of the VM, I'd, I'd highly recommend that article. Um, we've got uh, interaction going on with um, pod scheduling and zones. Oh, sorry, come on over. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Cool. All right, okay. So, sure. are you going to do it? No, I'll hold it. Okay. For you. Wow. David's going to give a demo, yeah, so he so needs keys free, hands free from the keyboard. So, as a part of the demo, I'm going to do it live over the internet, so nothing could possibly go wrong with that. Um, so, yeah, right here we have two components that we're going to deploy. I just wanted to call them out, and then especially for the first one, to have a link to its GitHub page, so you know where it is and where the documentation lives. The first one is the vSphere Cloud Controller Manager. So you need this in order to support the zones first, and then also second, because the CCM, the Cloud Controller Manager, actually participates in the labeling of things out there in, in vSphere land. So you're going to need that. And then obviously the second component, because this is what the talk is, it's the vSphere CSI uh, driver. So with that, instead of talking about it and showing you all the cool little notes for how to install it, we're just actually going to go ahead and do it. So I can have, so I have my, already logged into my master node here, and I'm already logged into my vSphere environment. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're going to deploy a stateful app, so basically a, a pod that's going to provision a disk and attach it to that pod so that we can have a stateful workload. It's gonna be a very simple pod, it's not gonna be complicated, but I wanted to brace, basically first start by taking a look at the environment. So I kind of made on purpose, yes, Good question. So uh, vCenter and the ESXi are, are 6, 7, U2 right now in this demo. So I have two, v, or two, uh, ES, or two vCenter servers. Um, the first one's shown here and has a single data center attached to it. And it has uh, a, the Kubernetes master and, th and four worker nodes. And if we look over here where my cursor is, um, it's tagged currently with the European region, and then the zone is European all. I just basically threw everything in there into the European all region. And then I have a second uh, vSphere, or a vCenter server. Now this one has two data centers. So the first one here, it's a little slow, but it's okay. The first one here is in the region US, and then the zone is US West, and it has three worker nodes <laughs> attached to it. And then I have a second data center in this vCenter server um, in region US and then uh, zone US East. So the first vCenter server is in Europe. The second vCenter server is in the US. It has two zones, East and West. And so the first thing we do is because we need to basically have a way for our pod to land in the correct region. And this is basically done by using the vSphere uh, Cloud Controller Manager, so the vSphere CCM. And if we, I'm going to just basically copy and paste a whole bunch of YAML. 
So this YAML, you can actually go in the Cloud Controller Manager repo. So I believe it's github.com slash Kubernetes slash uh, cloud, uh, cloud Controller Manager vSphere. And it's in the manifest folder. You can just download it all. The first thing you're going to need to do is update the, this YAML called secrets, which is basically going to store your vSphere creds, or your uh, vCenter server creds, uh, for both vCenter servers, right, because I'm using two of them. And then update. The second one is a config map. Basically, you're going to need to tell Kubernetes about some configuration information like data centers to the Cloud Controller Manager. And what we're going to do, and the rest basically does roles, role bindings, and then deploy the Cloud Controller Manager. So I'm just going to do that really quickly. Hopefully, all of this will work. First, go into the CCM folder. I already have all the YAML there because I downloaded it earlier. All right, and if we do really quickly, all right, so there we go, vSphere Cloud Controller Manager right there in the center. So that got deployed successfully. So that takes care of our zones for pod placement and the labels. The next thing we want to do is we, if we want to provision storage, we need to deploy the, the vSphere CSI driver. So just like before, what we need to do is if you have you know, your vSphere creds or whatever, you're going to need to update the secret. Um, and then same, it's actually the same configuration file. Uh, so you need to either you can use the same one or you can create a whole separate one if you want to have you know, your own way of doing things. And then next, it's going to deploy all of the CSI components that are required for the, the vSphere CSI driver to work. So there's an attacher component that, doesn't, like, that does a listen to basically attach the, the, the first class disk or the VMDK to the pod. There's a provisioner that actually will provision the pod. Then you have the RBAC for the controller component. Now that controller component is the one that does the actual creation, attaching, and all that stuff. Then the next one is you have is the, the node uh, daemon set, which basically, when you deploy that, it gets deployed to every node in your Kubernetes cluster so that can actually do the volume mounting. And then after that, we have, yeah, oh, sorry, the first ones are provisioner, attacher, RBAC, and then the actual uh, deploy of the provisioner and the attacher. So what I'm going to do is quickly copy and paste this down. It would be cool to go into the CSI folder. And I'm just going to, and it's already been downloaded from github.com slash Kubernetes slash SIGs slash vSphere CSI driver, I believe. Don't worry, the links are in the doc. You can download it later. I'm just going to paste it here. And hopefully all that stuff will get created. Okay, cool. So attacher controller, all the node components, and the provisioner. So now we're ready to deploy our stateful app. But before we do that, right, we need to first uh, create a, uh, a storage class and a persistent volume claim. And I just wanted to do a, just to call out what that storage class looks like. And the reason why is we want to, because we have multiple data stores or data store clusters spread out throughout the virtual infrastructure, what we need to do is we need to, what we're going to attempt to do is drop a pod, a stateful app, in the US East region. So it's basically the second vCenter server, the second data center that I talked about. And we're going to deploy a stateful app there. The problem is, is if we want to provision storage out of a particular data store, and the one that we're actually going to target, if we look at the storage view, is we're going to target this iSCSI 1 cluster in that data center. And so if we want to actually target the storage provision and the attachment of that first class disk or that VMDK, we need to give the CSI driver basically a hint saying we need it to be created here. And that's done in the storage class right here. So if we look at it, storage class is the kind, you know, for vSphere FCD, uh, blah, blah, blah. So parameters, data store cluster, because we want to target a data store cluster and not a data store. Then the actual data store or cluster name itself, so iSCSI1 cluster. And then here's where we can actually target where we want to actually provision that volume out of. So basically, we want to do region uh, US, 
and then zone US East. And that's how we're able to basically give the CSRI driver a hint where we actually want to deploy that thing. And I'll just quickly take a look at the PVC just so that we can note here that we're going to create a five gig disk. So let's go ahead and create the storage class and the persistent volume claim. Awesome. All right, now the last hopefully thing that will work. <laughs> We're going to actually provision a pod with using that, that storage, right? Create a stateful app. Now we're going to take a look at the pod spec here. So it's a simple pod spec. Pod, I'm just calling it my CSI app. We're just going to use the busy box image because I just, it's easy and it's quick. We're going to mount it to slash data. It's using that my FCD volume. Now we provided topology information to the storage class in order to provision the storage out of particular data store. But why we need to have this information also on the pod spec is basically when we want to actually land that pod, we need to land that pod in that particular zone to match with that, where that storage is being provisioned out of. So here you can see US, uh, region US, zone US East, and here we're using that uh, volume claim that we had created. And so let's go ahead and do that. And hopefully magically all this should work. Cool. Take a look at, do get all pods. So you can see right here at the top, the very first line, my CSI app, the container is getting created. And hopefully it should be created. And so it's running and hopefully everything is good. Now the next thing we're going to do is take a look really quick. We're going to describe the pod, my CSI app. Yeah, two which, Bs there. Insider joke, there's a, my B key sticks. Alrighty, so we did uh, basically a describe on the pod and we see it, that everything was created successfully. We see that the volume attached was happened, awesome. And then if we take a look at basically the rest of the information for the describe, we see that the actual mount for my FCD volume was actually mounted to slash data, cool. So that's good. And it, that it's running, awesome. And we also want to check, take a look to see where it's actually been targeted, right? So we wanted to throw it in US East in that zone. And so we notice here, if we look at which node that it is, this pod was actually deployed to, it was deployed at Kate's Worker 9. And just to prove that everything worked great, so we're going to go back to the host and clusters view. And we're going to go to Worker 9. And if we do an edit of that VM, that virtual machine, we should see a five gig disk attached to it, and that is the hard disk number two. Cool. So yeah, I just wanted to basically, it's, I think it's better to see it actually happen in person so that we're not smoke and mirrors kind of thing. And so yeah, that's basically a good demo about how you can deploy a state flap using both the cloud controller manager, remember for the zones and then the tagging, and then you know obviously the CSI driver to provision the storage and make sure it gets created in the right place. And with that, yes, it worked. So for troubleshooting, so I mean, there's a lot of information here. You can download the slide deck afterwards. But if you need help with any of this stuff, you know, obviously go into the Kubernetes Slack. You can go to SIG VMware. I'll be there. I'm always hanging out. Um, we have a bi-weekly SIG meeting uh, VM for VMware, the VMware SIG. You can definitely stop by and ask questions there. Everyone's welcome, users of vSphere and all that fun stuff. And then obviously if you encounter any problems, the GitHub page is there where you can create issues and we can you know, answer any questions or you know, if you run into issues, we can hopefully resolve them and, and that kind of stuff, or even new features. Um, so for debugging, I just wanted to put debugging and logs, I just wanted to point out some really important areas you might want to take a look if you do happen to run into problems, like if you want to provide logs to make our lives easier. Um, so the controller node, you know, just kind of as a recap, you can do basically, if I went back to the screen, back onto my master node, I can do a cube cuddle, and this is like the command you would use in order to get the logs for the controller. So the controller portion of the CSI driver is the one that actually does the, like, you know, volume create, volume delete, uh, volume attach, volume detach, and then 
if you want the node, so the node right gets deployed again to every node in the Kubernetes cluster because it's the one that's actually responsible for doing the volume mount for that particular VM. So if you want the to get the logs for that particular node, you can basically go run that command, but be sure to target. And the reason why it says uh, random right here in the middle is because per node, it's going to have a little random unique key, right, so that it can be uniquely identified to what host you actually want to pull the logs from. And then same with the CCM. The first command here is to show labels. The second command is to get logs. And then maybe every once in a while on the blue moon, um, some of the sidecar containers like that attacher and provisioner, um, you can get logs in a similar fashion, but just to let you know that they're there and they exist. And I didn't skip a slide. Okay, there we go. Perfect. Do you want to take that or want me to? Go ahead. Okay. So we talked briefly about like the migration from legacy CSI or legacy, the legacy entry provider to the uh, CSI for vSphere. So um, there, the, there is a process it's currently being worked on. Uh, it's not there yet. Um, but we'll have a more formal process around the time of GA. So that was around the July time frame. And we'll have, you know, if you have any questions about that regarding that, you can definitely stop by Slack and, you know, we'll be happy to answer any questions. But it is still currently in development because there is that, like, one-ish year gap where it's going to, the entry pri provider is going to be deprecated. There's, it's still being worked on and there's still enough time to, you know, work through that process and stuff like that. So I will say that the migration will be tricky, obviously. So the entry provider uses just plain vanilla VMDKs, and then the external CSI drivers uses first-class disk. Um, the first-class disk feature, just to really like, drive this point home, wasn't introduced until vSphere 6.5, and that there are many caveats about what features are available. But between the vSphere versions, since, you know, after 6.5. So as an example, uh, vSAN wasn't introduced until uh, 6.7 U1, I believe, or 6.7. And um, snapshots for vSAN, I don't believe, are available until 6.7 U2. So things like that, they're little caveats that you need to be aware of. And um, like the full featured support for the, the CSI driver when this thing goes GA, it will be 6.7 U3. So. Or higher, right? But maybe David, let's uh, take an opportunity here because there are different feature sets. I'd, we'll get to Q and A in a moment, but I want to ask a question to the audience as to what versions you might be on. Uh, Time is, for feedback. Yeah. So if you if you're on something older than six seven, could you raise your hand? So that's ESX host and vCenter server, by the way. So I'd say that's 10 to 12. Maybe some people have small hand raises. Uh, so I gather, just to prove my point, the rest of you, if you're on 6, 7, raise your hand. 6, 7 or higher. So to repeat it, how many people are willing to start using 6.7 U3 to get more features? Uh, we got a couple who aren't yeah. willing. Okay. Okay. So Thanks, Sue. Yeah, feedback's good, definitely. Okay, go back. You had personal recommendations. So, so if you want to like try to attempt to move now, I, you know. I wait for a migration path and some more guidance. Um, if you want to kick the tires to try to do like a migration on your own, um, the safest thing to do, and I'm just floating the idea out here, stand up in the exact environment, and you can do it. Oh, just an idea if you just want to kind of kick the tires. If you want to attempt to do a migration, and I'm not saying this is a good idea or a bad idea, but at least it's the safest idea. Is stand up a six seven U two environment somewhere else. Um, you can use basically the in-app, hopefully whatever stateful application you have has some sort of replication feature. You can replicate the data to your other n new cluster using 6.7, U2, or whatever. And then if that ch all, everything else checks out, 
then you can basically switch everything over. And that is legit the safest way you could possibly do it. That's just a personal recommendation. Um, because if anything goes wrong with the, your new environment, you have your old environment you can always not switch over to, and it's still there, and it's still pr completely functional. And you know, no one ever gets it right on the first time. And if you need three or four attempts, because you have your old environment, you can always make those three or four attempts until you get it right. And it's the safest route. That's just a personal recommendation for me. Um, there will be a more formal process when it comes out, but I just wanted to float the idea out there in the interest of community and kind of like what I think is safe. But that's just my personal recommendation. OK. So thank you. Um, here's our contact information, a link to the deck up there if you want to take a picture of it. That deck also got uploaded to the conference website, so if you don't have your camera ready, just go on to the schedule and there's an uploaded copy of this deck there. Uh, if you want, um, we have this VMware SIG that meets so that if you go home and try to do this and have any issues, uh, I'd encourage you to get involved with the VMware SIG. It meets every two weeks uh, with a Zoom meeting. We have an active Slack channel as well, a somewhat less active mailing list. and go out there and reach out to us. Uh, I guess that's, that's about it. I'll open it up to questions. Anybody want to raise anything? Yeah, let me bring you the mic. So I was wondering more about monitoring these first class disks. Will vSphere or the CSI driver provide something, pull out some metrics, make it possible for me to get an alert when a disk is about to become full? I think I'll leave that to you, David. So there are definitely you know, tools out there, a part of the vSphere you know, uh, ecosystem. So there's Wavefront that can, you know, basically hook into Kubernetes and say, and you know, grab metrics and stuff like that. I personally haven't used Wavefront enough to know whether or not that they'll actually give you the information. I'd have to believe that they would put that in there because I hear that question a lot. So I would imagine that you could set up some form of alert or something like that to say, hey, this disk is starting to approach full. We need to do something about it. So, um, but yeah, if you want to stop by the VMware booth, um, definitely talk to some, there's some guys out there that are a part of it, and you can definitely get more information. And if not, I can, oh, yes, I forgot. There is a Wavefront booth, so it's definitely stop by their booth. He's one of the devs working on, on this. Anybody else got a question? There we go. What about uh, acquiring existing VMDKs into your Kubernetes uh, environment? Um, I don't believe that, that that's an easy act, the way that the underlying storage plugin works. Uh, you, may be, you may be able to end up there by first deploying one and copying it somehow, but uh, Kubernetes itself was designed to abstract that kind of thing out, and kind of the best practices ways of even consuming storage would not have you do things like hard coding a specific data store, much less a volume. Uh, the right way to do it in your uh, pod spec is to specify a storage class, which is pretty broad. So I would say that that would probably be best handled at an application level of uh, composing something and perhaps copying it over or swapping it out. OK. Glenn? Uh, um, what was the question, inline volume? Oh, he wants to know if you, suppose you had an existing volume with data on it, could you end up mapping that to a Kubernetes pod? Am I correct? That was essentially your answer, your question? Um, yeah, I mean, we have inline volume now, but inline volume right now is for uh, ephemeral data. 
Um, We've been so, cut off. So, so okay. uh, that could be a okay. path to, to, okay. to I mean, I, I would like to find out more on the context of how that data would be used, but inline volume would be uh, something to consider, and also lo local storage as well. Okay, we're, uh, we've got another speaker waiting for this, but we'll move to the hallway, so feel free to come out and ask whatever you want. We can hang around. <laughs>